Welcome to this message by Ray Stedman titled, The Infallible Posture, from RaySteadman.org. The text for this message is from Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. We come now this morning to the last message in our series on the great passage of Paul in the closing words of the letter to the Ephesians. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And we've been viewing the struggle of life in the light of Paul's great revelation that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, the powers, the rulers of darkness, of, the, of this world's darkness, and the spiritual hosts of wickedness in high places. As we've been trying to see throughout this series, uh, all that happens to us in our lives as Christians, which discourages us, which defeats us or confuses us or renders us indifferent to the great truth of God, is part of this great struggle that Paul speaks of. It's a manifestation of this conflict in which we are engaged. We've come to the close of a year. And uh, as is the habit of most on the end of a year, we've been looking back upon the year that's closed. We've been aware of failure, of, of problem, of weakness, of obstinacy, and the stubbornness of rebellion, and so many other things in our life of which we're not proud. And these have simply been manifestations of this great struggle with which we're in which we're engaged. We're looking forward now to a new year, and we know it will be a time of conflict, another time of struggle. Well, what are we to do about this? How are we to fight back? In practical terms, what do we do about the struggle that we face? This is what has engaged us in this passage. And the answer, as we've seen, is in two things. First, we're to put on the armor of God, Paul says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, with the clear implication that if we don't put on the whole armor of God, we won't be able to stand. And if we don't believe that now, life itself will prove it to us, that we cannot stand without this armor. And the armor, as we've seen, is figurative language for a very real thing. It is realizing what we are in Christ and what Christ is to us now in very practical terms. Put on the whole armor of God is another phrase that says exactly the same thing as Paul says in Romans when he says, Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin and alive unto God. This is the glory of the scriptures. It takes the same truth and puts it in a dozen different ways in order that we might have uh, uh, an approach to, uh, to these great truths and understand them clearly. And as we, as we obey what the apostle says and think through the implications of our faith, we find that everything comes down ultimately to that first thing, which is Jesus Christ as the truth. Gird on, gird up our loins with the truth, the girdle of truth. And that all of our Christian faith then relates and derives from the authority of Jesus Christ. He is the truth. That's the first thing. We're to put on the whole armor of God. And then as we saw last week, the second thing he tell, tells us to do is to pray. Not merely put on the armor, but pray. Not only think about what Christ is and what the great truths that he makes clear are, but to talk to God about them, to lean on his help, to hold conversation with him, to uh, uh, engage ourselves directly and personally with the God who is our strength and our help. I've been noticing ever since Christmas that young people uh, are, have a new toy to play with on, frequently on the corners and on the streets. I've seen them, and you have too, boys and sometimes girls with walkie-talkies. 
in which they're keeping in contact with some uh, some pal or chum somewhere out of sight, but they're talking to somebody. And uh, this is one of the most uh, delightful things about some of the uh, advancements that science has brought to us is this ability to keep in constant communication if we care to with someone. But it's nothing new. It's only what God has made available in Christ from the very beginning that we can talk to him, pray about these things. But now we come to the last word in the apostles' admonitions to us in this passage, and it is given to us in but one word. It's a word which is repeated four different times throughout this whole passage. It's the word stand. Notice how it comes in here. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 13, therefore take the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And then the next verse, stand, therefore. In, in other words, everything heads up in this, everything aims at this, that we might be able to stand. Well, what does it mean to stand? Well, we know what that word means. Some of us were watching the Rose Bowl game yesterday. And we saw that uh, when the pressure was on and Michigan State was trying its, its uh, hardest to reach the, the goal line, UCLA would stand, that's all. They would simply line up on the line of scrimmage and stand and refuse to be moved and thus maintain the advantage that they had gained. And this is exactly what this word means to us. We are to refuse to move from the ground of faith that we've taken. Refuse to yield ground. Stand. In the words of a modern advertisement, join the unswitchables. <laughs> Having done all, and only then, are we to stand. Unswitchable. Now, why does the apostle say this? Why doesn't he say, fight? Having done all, now fight. Put on the whole armor of God and then fight or advance or charge or some of the, uh, uh, of the other military terms that speak of moving out. We must take these words seriously because, after all, these are not play words, just used lightly as children would in, uh, in playing games. These are serious commands in a very serious fight. And the apostle uses the word stand because it's the only proper word to use. It's the only word which sets forth the final attitude we must have to ensure absolute victory. And I think as we look at this word more carefully, we can see that it discloses three aspects of the struggle of life to us. First, the use of this word stand implies and reveals to us the intensity of the struggle in which we're involved. We're told to stand because there are times when that's all we can do and the most we can do all we can possibly hope to achieve at times in this struggle is that we simply stand unmoved. There are times in battle when a soldier can do no more than just simply try to protect himself and stay where he is. The intensity of the conflict becomes so real, so furious, so fierce that there's nothing else you can do but just simply hope to hold your ground. And that's what this word implies to us. Paul has already spoken in this passage about evil days that come. Now, thank God, all of life are not, is not evil days. But evil days come. Days when circumstances simply stagger us. When we face some <clears throat> combination of events or some, uh, some impelling tragedy or circumstance that knocks us off our feet, or attempts to at least, 
And uh, we can do nothing else but hope to stand where we are. There are times when doubts plague us. We're so exposed, seemingly, to intellectual attack that we find that we can have all we can do to assert any degree of faith at all. There are situations and circumstances into which we can come we are, where we are overridden, overwhelmed with fears and anxieties. And we scarcely can keep our, our uh, demeanor, keep our heads, because we're under pressure. There are times when indifference seems to so sap our spiritual strength that we, we have lost all our vitality. It drains away our will and our motive, and we seem unable to make ourselves even want to do the simplest things to maintain and retain faith. You see, this is part of the struggle. We get disturbed when we see our apparent growth stopped in the Christian life. Our ministry or our witness seems to be impossible or ineffective. And all the challenge and the keenness of spiritual life is gone. Well, what are we to do then? We're to gird up our loins, Paul says, put on the whole armor of God, pray, and having done all, stand. You see? Even though putting on the armor and girding up the loins and reviewing what we are in Christ and praying. Uh, even though we do this, it may not necessarily change the circumstances. The attack is just as fierce. Well, then what? Well, then stand. Just stay right where you are. Refuse to go. Refuse to think anymore. Stand right where you are until the attack lessens. This is the final word. Everywhere the word of God warns us that as we draw nearer the time of our Lord's return, draw nearer to the end, the evil days will come more frequently. The Bible always has told us that there will be evil days. There are passages that we read in our scriptures, I think, sometimes wrongly. Uh, the passages in Timothy, for instance, that speak about in the latter times, the Spirit says expressly, that men shall grow worse and worse, and so on. And we read that as though it was all to come at a closing moment of the age. The latter times means the whole of the age, from our Lord's first coming until his second. And he's not talking about uh, one particular time of trouble reserved for the last. He's talking about repetitive cycles of trouble that come again and again throughout the whole course of these latter days. But the word also makes clearer that these cycles become fiercer in intensity and more widespread in their impact as the age draws to its close. We can see this in the growing awareness of our day that we live in a one-world community. We are no longer separated from uh, other peoples at great distances of thought or or influence. What happens on the other side of the world today affects us tomorrow. And we're so aware of this. Evil days were once limited geographically. There have always been times when persecution has grown intense in various places, or economic pressures have become very severe in certain areas, while in other areas things were fine and coming along nicely and or the pressure of thought was not as great. But now, as the age goes on, these areas become more widespread. Now they're worldwide in their impact. Surely we don't have to press this point. We realize today, we here in America, we're living in a, on an island of relative peace and security in the midst of an enormous sea of trouble and distress in our world. And uh, that sea is encroaching constantly upon our relative security. There is an irresistible rising tide, uh, the lappings of the waters of which we can already hear. 
conditions are not getting better in our world. Any honest, heart-facing world conditions must admit this, but worsening. The vaunted solutions of very sincere men are not working. The ways that we hope to solve our problems and the ways, uh, the uh, approaches to our problems upon which we men pin their faith, such as education, scientific discoveries, and uh, economic improvements, better legislation. These things are not working. Not that they don't have their place. We're not suggesting they be, uh, th they be discarded. They're working to some degree, but they're not solving the problem. They're getting worse. It's getting worse. Because as we've seen all along in this account, the issue never lies in these superficial surface things. It lies much deeper, it lies in the hearts and souls of men under the domination of a cruel and resistless power, resistless in human strength, that dominates the world, what Paul calls the world rulers of this present darkness. And only the delivering strength of Jesus Christ is adequate to deal with it. This is being confirmed to us from rather unexpected sources these days. Listen to this paragraph from a contemporary non-Christian writer. He says, I remind you of what is happening in the great cities of the earth today. Chicago, Detroit, Pittsburgh, London, Manchester, Paris, Tokyo, Hong Kong, and the rest. These cities are, for the most part, vast pools of human misery, networks of raw human nerves exposed without benefit of illusion or hope to the new godless world wrought by industrial man. The people in these cities are lost. Some of them are so lost that they no longer even know it. And they are the real lost ones. They haunt the movies for distraction. They gamble. They depress their sensibilities with alcohol. Or they seek strong sensations to dull their sense of a meaningless existence. That's the world we're facing in 1966. And in the face of this, there are many who are faltering in their faith, many who are failing. This very week, the newspapers in our area reported the resignation from the Christian ministry of a man who once was very closely associated with us here, who's giving up his ministry and uh, doing so because he says he no longer can stand it, no longer can face it. A man whose ministry was once in the power and effectiveness of the word of God. But because his faith began to fail, his ministry has failed. And now he's quitting. This past year uh, has recorded uh, the record of half a dozen outstanding Christian leaders who suffered moral collapse. And therefore have been laid in the shelf. Their ministry, their testimony brought to an end. And this is happening all over. Now, God is permitting this in order to separate the phony from the true. He says he'll do this. The word makes it very clear. There's that passage in Hebrews in which we're told that the things which, are shake, uh, which uh, can be shaken will be shaken. God is allowing these things to unveil the genuine and to remove what can be shaken in order that what cannot be shaken might remain. And therefore the evil days come. And when they come, you will be glad when it comes into your own personal experience that the word of God to you is to put on the whole armor of God and pray and then stand. Because you'll realize that there's nothing else you can do. And that you're winning when you stand. Not long ago I ran across a letter from a missionary out in the uh, uh, jungles of New Guinea, who, uh, who wrote back home. And he's caught the very spirit of our Christian faith. And he says these, this, these words. Man, he says, it's great to be in the thick of the fight, to draw the old devil's heaviest guns, to have him at you with depression and discouragement, slander and disease. He doesn't waste time on a lukewarm bunch 
he hits good and hard. When a fellow is hitting him, you can always measure the weight of your blow by the one you get back. When you're on your back with fever and at your last ounce of strength, when some of your converts backslide, when you learn that your most promising inquirers are only fooling, when your mail gets held up and some don't bother to answer your letters, is that the time to put on mourning? No, sir. That's the time to pull out the stops and shout hallelujah. The old fellow's getting it in the neck and hitting back. Heaven is leaning over the battlements and watching. Will he stick it? And as they see who is with us, as they see the unlimited reserves, the boundless resources, as they see the impossibility of failure, how disgusted and sad they must be when we run away. And then he says, glory to God, we are not going to run away. We're going to stand. Join the unswitchables. That's the Christian work. Now, there's a second thing indicated by this word stand, and that is it points out for us and indicates to us something of the character of the battle the Christian faces. We are to stand because this is a defensive action, primarily, and a proper defense will win the day. I know that is oftentimes misunderstood, but if a castle is under attack from an army, the battle is not won by those in the castle venturing forth to overwhelm the army outside the castle defenses. The battle is won by repelling all invasion. And this is the picture of our Christian life. This is a defensive battle, not offensive. In other words, we are not out to try to take ground. We are to defend that which is already ours. You see, in the Christian battle, the offensive work was done 1,900 years ago on the cross and the resurrection. The Lord Jesus is the only one who is, has the power and strength to take the offense in this great battle with the prince of, the, of darkness. And he's done that. Therefore, all that we possess as believers is given to us. We don't fight for it. We don't battle to be saved or to fight to be justified or forgiven or accepted into the family of God. All these things are given to us. They were won by another who, in the words of Paul in Colossians, took principalities and powers and nailed them to his cross, triumphing over it, them in it, and led them captive who had held the world captive. They were won, you see, by another, and they were given to us. But we fight to use all this, to enjoy it, to fully experience it. That's where the battle lies. The enemy is trying to keep us from realizing what we have and from using it to the full. And there's where the battle lines are. We do not need to take new ground as Christians. We cannot do this. All of it has been accomplished all is given to us, as Jude says in almost the last word of the New Testament. Contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered unto the saints. We're to hold on to that which God gives us. That's the point. And not let one bit of it be lost or taken from us as to our use of it. And that's what that phrase means, contend earnestly for the faith. It doesn't mean to attack uh, everyone who doesn't agree with you and brand them as a communist. It means to hold on to what God has already given you and utilize it to the full. As Paul writes to the, Thess to the Corinthians, stand fast in the faith. Do not give up any of it. Quit you like men. Be strong, he says. Don't surrender an inch of ground even though others do. Well, someone says, well, this is so negative, so defensive. I don't like to hear you talk like this. It sounds as though Christians are to cover their heads and avoid all contact with the world and try somehow to get through life and get on to heaven someday, uncontaminated. 
Well, that's exactly, of course, the twist that the, de the devil delights to give this word, stand. It is defensive action. But the amazing thing is that this kind of defensive action becomes the greatest offense that the Christian can dis demonstrate. The fact is that only the Christian who learns to stand and to give up no segment of his faith, but to put on the armor of God and to pray and thus be unmovable is the only Christian who in any way will or can touch the world around about him. He's the only one who will reflect the love of Christ in the midst of a very unlovely situation. He's the only one who will be able to manifest peace and and certainty and poise and assurance in the midst of a very troubled and unhappy situation. You see, it's, it's Christians who learn to stand, who make it possible for there to be some degree of rest and, and, and enjoyment in life. For all the world, we are the salt of the earth, Jesus said. Ah, but if the salt has lost its savor, what good is it? Good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the feet of men. And that's by and large what the world is doing with the church these days. Trod treading it underfoot. Worthless. Useless. That's because we haven't learned to stand. To stand. But when a Christian learns to stand, it's the very fact that he can stand when everybody else is falling that draws the attention of others and makes them seek his secret. I remind you again of those accurate words of Kipling describing what manhood is. If you can keep your head when all around you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you and make allowance for their doubting too, you see, that's what makes people look and listen and say, what is this these people have? They don't give way like we do. They don't go along with the rest of the crowd. They seem to be able to uh, resist some of these compelling pressures that we have to give in to. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being lied about, don't deal in lies. If you can, or being hated, don't give way to hating, and yet not talk too good, nor act too wise. You see, that's what manhood is. That's what God's after. That's what he wants to make us in Christ. And the battle is not to become that kind of a man. That's the kind of a man Christ makes us when we believe. The battle is to show it, to reveal it, to manifest it what we are, and thus to f refuse to believe the lies that will keep us weak and make us act like an animal rather than like a man. Put on the whole armor of God, all that Christ is. Pray, and having done all, stand. Now there's a third thing suggested by this word, and that is the certainty of victory. If armor, if putting on the armor of God in prayer makes it possible to stand, unmoved and unmovable, then there's nothing more required to win. That's all it takes. After all, if a castle cannot be taken, the attacking army has nothing left to do but to withdraw. <laughs> there's nothing else it can do. It's defeated, beaten. We've been talking a great deal in this series about the cleverness of Satan, about his subtlety of attack, the wiles of the devil and the impossibility of defeating him by merely human wisdom. We have said that every saint in the record of the scripture, every believer throughout the history of time, has been at one time or another defeated by the devil when he's tried to match which with him in his own strength. And this is true. But it's also true that when any saint, any believer, even the newest and the weakest, stands in the strength of God, puts on the whole armor of Christ, and in dependence upon the presence of God in prayer, stands. 
that the devil is always defeated. Always defeated. This is because of a basic weakness, if I might put it that way, a fatal flaw in the devil's approach. When the believer stands on the ground of faith, the devil always overreaches himself. He always goes too far. That's because he commits himself, you see, to extremes. And in that lies his defeat. Sooner or later, the reality, which is truth, must become apparent. The devil can never take the ground of truth because that, of course, would defeat his own aims. He can't defend and, and support God. He's out to destroy and attack him. Therefore, all that's left, because God is truth, all that the devil can do is to take the ground of untruth, of extremes, distortions, wrongness. And ultimately, because God is truth, and truth is always the reflection of God, and God never changes, truth then must always ultimately prevail. And that's been the history of the world, isn't it? And it will be the continuing history from now on. <clears throat> Perhaps Abraham Lincoln put it as well as it could be put in that famous quotation of his. It's possible, he said, to fool some of the people all of the time. <clears throat> and all of the people some of the time. But it, <coughs> excuse me, it's impossible to fool all of the people all of the time. Truth comes out. God is truth. And therefore, live with it long enough, stand on it long enough, and it will come out and reveal itself. This explains what we have referred to at times as the phenomena of fashions in evil. Anyone who's been a Christian for a considerable period of time learns that, uh, that error comes in cycles like uh, style and fashions. And you may be out of style for a while, but if you just stay with the same style, it'll come back in after a bit. And if you're standing on the truth of God, there will be times when it will be regarded with utter scorn by the world and laughed at, and you'll be made a mockery. But if you do like these foolish people who think they have to adjust to every sweeping current of the times and try to maintain intellectual respectability at all times, you'll find that when you adjust, the styles change and you're out of style again. But if you stand fast on what God has declared unchangeably, you'll find this strange phenomena happening, that the very truths that, that ten years ago were looked down upon and laughed at and scorned by the world suddenly come into fashion again and are held up as being a sudden new discovery of the brilliant intellect of men. And you who have been believing it all the time are now right back in style once again. You see, that's because truth never changes. And the devil, you see, must always ultimately be defeated if anyone will simply stand on what God has said. I often think that the devil uh, has a very cruel fate and destiny marked out for him in this respect because he's continually defeated by the very weapons with it which he tries to use against God and his people. And therefore, it's so foolish to believe the lies of the devil. It's, I often think the devil is like the villain in these Western melodramas. Uh, remember how the plot always develops? It looks so threatening to the hero, especially the heroine. And the villain is there twirling his mustache and rubbing his hands and, and uh, thinking he has her in his power. But... At last, and at the critical moment, the hero arrives, and uh, the plot suddenly changes, and the villain is beaten by his own devices, and he slinks off the stage saying, Curses, foiled again. Now, that's the devil when he attacks any Christian who's willing to stand. You see, the cross is the great example of this. The cross looked like the supreme achievement of the devil, the supreme moment of victory. 
when all the powers of darkness were howling with glee as they saw the Son of God beaten, wounded, rejected, despised, hanging upon a cross, naked in the eyes of the world. It looked like the hour of darkness. Jesus said it was. This is your hour, he says, in the power of darkness. But it was that very moment, it was the moment of defeat. When the devil lost, and in the cross, all that the devil had uh, risked and ventured upon was cast aside, beaten down. And the devil and his all his angels were nailed to the cross, openly displayed uh, as beaten and defeated by the power of Jesus Christ. This is what the devil does and what God does all through life. The devil sends sickness and defeat and death and darkness into our lives and pain and suffering and tragedy. Yes, it's the work of Satan. But that isn't the whole of the story. God takes those very things, those very things, and uses them to strengthen us and bless us and teach us and enlarge us and fulfill us if we stand, if we stand. This is the whole of the scripture, you see. I ran across this quotation, I close with this this morning, from a, um, a Christian, a man who has, who has been an invalid all his life, one of those lonely, obscure people who live in constant pain and who uh, has not doesn't know what it means to be able to use his physical body in any way except to, in pain and suffering. But he writes this, Loneliness, he says, is not a thing of itself, not an evil sent to rob us of the joys of life. Loneliness, loss, pain, sorrow, these are disciplines. God's gifts to drive us to his very heart to increase our capacity for him, to sharpen our sensitivities and understanding, to temper our spiritual lives so that they may become channels of his mercy to others and so bear fruit for his kingdom. But these disciplines must be seized upon and used, not thwarted, must not be seen as excuses for living in the shadows of half-lives, but as messengers, however painful, to bring our souls into vital contact with the living God, that our lives may be filled to overflowing with himself in ways that may perhaps be impossible to, the, to those who know less of life's darkness. Now, that's what it means to stand. One of these days, the, the Bible says the struggle will end. It will end for all of us at the end of our lives, but if not, before then, it will end in the coming of the Lord in this day and age. Someday it will be over. There's no doubt of that. And someday it will be written of some, as it's recorded in the book of Revelation, they overcame him, the great dragon, the devil. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, having loved not their lives unto death. And the great issue, you see, of life is not how much money we make and how much favor we gather, how much of a name we make for ourselves. The great issue, above all, is whether it can be written of us as we come to the end, he overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of his testimony, having loved not his life unto death. Shall we pray? These are perilous days, our Father. How much aware we're made of these by our newspapers. And yet how false a view of life the newspapers give us. If we would look at life from that point of view, we would feel that sometimes life is wonderful and glorious and has no problems. And everyone's getting along fine. 
or we would be utterly cast down in defeat and in dispiritedness with no hope. But we thank you, Lord, we don't get our view of life from newspapers. We get it from thy living word, from the reality of that. Help us to believe it and obey it and thus to stand undefeated, undefeatable. In Christ's name, amen.